the beginning of 2022, I was lovingly invited to participate in a closed technical test for Warner Brothers Multiverses. As an outspoken fan of both platform fighters and a decent amount of the properties in the initial reveal trailer, I was more than down to try it out. But what I wasn't expecting was for this game to be the most fun I have had gaming in a very long time. Up until very recently, I hadn't seen people give this game the time of day it deserves. And even today, when it's one of the most popular games in the world according to player counts, many just dismiss it as another cash-in from the WB to try and rake in that sweet, sweet crossover money. As both a Warner Bros. crossover and a non-Smash platform fighter, it's pretty understandable why so many people would be hesitant to be excited for such a product. This game is something truly special, and something that I hope is here to stay for a long, long time. This is why you should be playing Multiverses. Hey everyone, I'm RV Rocks, and there is no intro because Multiverses is here! When it first came out into the limelight with a gameplay demonstration, Multiverses failed to turn heads, including mine. But I still signed up for the closed technical test because, well, I'm 21 with Gen X parents, I'm not immune to this character nostalgia pandering. But what I didn't expect was to get in. And even more so, I did not expect to love it as much as I did. In the first tech test that I participated in alone, I racked up 23 hours in the game. So believe me when I tell you, while the hype at first might have been slow, multiverses played so well in motion that any complaints I had going in have been quickly squashed, silenced, and erased from my brain. Multiverses is the first time I have touched a platform fighter that wasn't Super Smash Bros, and felt enthralled by it, felt enticed by it. Most of the time, I pick up one of these games, I look at the roster, play each of the characters like once or twice to see their moves, and then I move on with my life. But multiverses, well, I felt the need to improve, to keep going, to keep playing, and unlock new characters. It's very exciting in that way. Multiverses is a lot of things, but first and foremost, multiverses is different. But how is multiverses different, and why does it work so well? I would say it falls down into three different categories. It incentivizes progression, breaks the status quo, and arguably, most importantly, it delivers the fan service. Let's start with progression, because handling this correctly is how this game is going to live or die. I have seen a lot of people call Multiverses a Warner Brothers Smash clone. And while that is true to an extent, I think the comparison is quite reductive. Because while the main platform fighter gameplay is reminiscent to that of Smash Bros, but actually still quite different, I'll get to that later, everything surrounding this game's economy, progression, and general feel is vastly different. If I had to liken this game's progression to something else in the gaming space, a better comparison to make would be something akin to Fortnite Battle Royale meets League of Legends in the way of long-term player investment. They're going games of the service with this one, free to play, but releasing characters, skins, new stages, and otherwise new content that might require some payments, but is likely going to be mostly free. Let's start there. I have always been of the mind that fighting games are the perfect fit for games as a service games. There are certain genres that I definitely don't think work for this content model, but a fighting game where most post-launch content comes in the form of new characters to use, and especially in a platform fighter where both stages and characters are heavily important to the game, it kind of becomes a match made in heaven. And this line of thinking works perfectly in application for multiverses. As of right now, the game has a pretty small battle pass, one that I imagine will only get bigger after we get out of beta. A battle pass which has you progressing ever so slowly through normal gameplay, but speeding up with daily and seasonal challenges. Pretty cut and paste from other more popular games, all things considered, but hey, you know what? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. This battle pass works exactly as you'd expect from a good battle pass system. No inherent gameplay changes are given on the battle pass, but rather costumes, ring out animations, player icons, basically again, standard what you would expect. And me personally, I have no qualms with how the battle pass works in this game. Progression could be faster, but you know, I still finished it with like a week and a half to go in the open beta, so I think it's fine. You start out with four characters randomly decided on in a bi-weekly rotation, and you get to progress in the battle pass, get coins, cosmetics, and a very likely unintended side effect of this system is that you get to unlock new characters one at a time like in the days of yore. It's fun like that. 
Here's where we shake things up though. Each character also has an individual battle pass associated with them. And that's where the progression really starts to sink its hooks in you. And unlike the main battle pass, the character battle passes are progressed exclusively through experience gains, which can be boosted, but even then you have to grind to unlock these. Which once again, I will reiterate, this system is kind of perfect for a fighting game. These individual character battle passes include more of what you would expect. Cosmetics for or around your character, XP boost, toasts, which is basically your way of like cheersing the enemies, but these also contain perks. And that is where the game truly starts to set itself apart. Perks are small changes that you use to individually customize each one of the characters on the multiverse's roster. There are two types of perks. Minor perks range from getting slightly higher movement to slightly higher damage and are non-character dependent once you reach a certain level. You can equip three of these at any given time and are split up into three different categories being utility, defensive, and offensive perks. And then there's the mega perks. And the mega perks are where this game gets really interesting. These perks are character specific and allow you to change fundamental properties on the character of your choice. You wanna make Steven into a summoner? Go for it. You wanna give Wonder Woman a tipper? Perfect. You wanna make Jake constantly bounce up and down to annoy the hell out of the opponent? Why not? And let's be clear, none of these are extreme changes, but they don't have to be. Just a little bit of customization can go a very long way in making you feel truly aligned with the character that you like to play as. And earning these customizable perks comes through completing every character's individual mastery battle pass. And these things are pretty meaty. In my time with this most recent open beta, I have only fully completed two characters. And trust me, I have been playing a lot of every character character. And that is a testament to how enjoyable each of these characters are, how compelling the core gameplay is, and how intuitively the game baits you into its progression systems. I firmly believe that at this pace with this system, multiverses could be one of the finest free-to-play games of our time. However, this is where I have to talk about the whole free-to-play tax that comes with this experience. Needless to say, since this is a free-to-play game, the folks over at Player First Games have to make money somehow. And in my opinion, they kind of succeed at delivering that Player First title that they are known for. This game implements the free-to-play tax in the form of Gleemium. This is your premium currency, your V-Bucks, and you can use it to buy cosmetics or speed up the grind for yourself. And I'll just be honest and say that these are a bit more integrated into the game than I would like. In comparison to stuff like Fortnite, it's a tad more expensive and that's a shame because these costumes are so fucking good. But in complete fairness, I can excuse that because I think what you get for completely free is far more valuable than anything locked behind a paywall. You get one character completely unlocked, four random ones on rotation with individual progressions saved on them for when you eventually do unlock them, and the ability to unlock the entire roster without paying a single cent if you're truly dedicated. And especially considering that in a fighting game, where a lot of the long-term players will have one main character that they tackle everything with, you might be able to luck out and get someone that you really like early on. Yes, progression can be slow, and as they add more characters, the grind will only go up for completely free-to-play players. But there's also the possibility of stuff like sales, events that boost currency gain, bundles, and a more complete understanding of the player base that only comes with time. However, to be completely fair, the pendulum can swing both ways, and there's always the possibility that upper management could really screw this game over big time. Either through slowing free progression, or having the most powerful perks be some kind of premium currency only, or any other number of terrible free-to-play tricks. The game's director, Tony Huynh, has been very chill and candid about how he doesn't want any of the real-world money stuff to feel too in your face. And I have no reason to doubt him based off everything that he has said throughout all of the game's pre-release hype. But hey, if stuff does go downhill, I am putting this portion into the video to remind you that I was completely unaware and will be deeply depressed if some bad freemium management screws over this game's potential. So this game's progression allows for everything to be nicely tied back into gameplay, so you're always moving forwards towards the next big step for your personal roster. 
I have established that much. I already discussed the perk system and how that allows for you to fine tune characters to be just to your liking. But that's not the only thing that has multiverses breaking the status quo. The entire game runs differently. Multiverses is fundamentally different from others in the space. There is no shielding, just a single spot dodge and roll. There is no ledge grabbing, but every single hard surface is able to be wall jumped off of a la Super Metroid. There is no grabbing, no dash attacks, no back airs, but most importantly, Multiverses is a platform fighter with de-emphasized platforming and a much larger focus on movement, especially in the air. For instance, once you are in the air, every character in the roster universally can use two air dashes, two jumps, and two up specials before landing. Every character is also decently fast. It creates the scenario where if you're in the middle of the stage, within one to two seconds, you can basically maneuver anywhere on the screen with hardly, if any, advanced movement tech. This changes everything. A lot of Smash Bros, and by extension other platform fighters, is trying to stop people from successfully recovering to the stage. Certain characters basically have no way to recover if they accidentally get too far below the stage. Whereas in multiverses, every character can recover to the stage from anywhere on screen at any moment, creating an overall environment where it's more about managing your movement abilities to be able to recover than the actual act of recovering. If I'm juggling someone and their teammate hits me off, it's possible that I wasted all my jumps and created an unwinnable situation for myself especially since a lot of these up specials don't really gain you that much vertical distance. However, to be clear, you can still gimp recoveries. It's just less common and the game feels far more dependent on knockouts using big hits than causing people to be unable to recover. So big gameplay difference number one, customization. Big gameplay difference number two, enhanced air capabilities, less recovery focused gameplay. Big difference number three, moveset variety. In Super Smash Bros, every character has three types of moves. The standard tilt attacks, the hard hitting smash attacks, and the very unique special attacks. This is yet another system that Smash Bros popularized and everyone else just kinda copied when it came time to make their game. But Multiverses plays it super differently and only has standard attacks and special attacks. And you might be thinking to yourself, oh man, that means Multiverses has less advanced movesets than Smash. And you couldn't be more wrong, you stupid idiot. To try and explain this phenomenon concisely, rather than having Smash's standard, hard-hitting, and unique property attacks, there's the standard attacks that sometimes have unique properties, and the unique property attacks, which sometimes can be standard. And that isn't even mentioning that most characters have completely different movesets for both special and standard attacks in the air. There is very little consistency in movesets across the multiverse's roster, especially in comparison to something like Smash. But call me crazy, I really like how deep and wacky these movesets can be. The variability in movesets, while likely going to be pretty confusing for the new player, allows for every character to feel truly different and allow for someone like me, who really enjoys learning new characters, to have a whole wealth of knowledge to pursue in these characters' movesets. There's not even a proper analog to smash attacks. Some characters just have moves that can be charged, and that's it. Add in big difference number four, the game's main mechanic of co-op 2v2 focused gameplay, and this depth becomes comical amounts of ridiculous. Characters have moves that buff up teammates, move teammates, create teammates, create debuffs, allow for debuffs to be comboed into. Not to mention, a lot of characters have moves with pretty hefty cooldowns, and while those moves are on cooldown, they've been replaced with a completely different move. I have said the word moves so many times in the last minute alone, but it's only logical to do so with how many different moves each character has at their disposal. And that brings me to the characters, and I guess the start of the delivering fan service portion of the video, but we will still be talking pretty heavily about gameplay here too. This game's roster and fan service are easily its strongest suit right now. I have had the most fun with this game when picking up a new guy and seeing what they do, what voice lines they have, what costumes are available, it's a very infectious cycle. And if there is anyone to rival Nintendo and Smash Bros in regards to iconic characters and fan service, 
well, Warner Brothers can definitely put up a pretty good fight. I will start out this portion with a little bit of a compliment sandwich and say that I love the voice acting. After having written the first draft of the script, they released this little teaser showing all the characters talking to each other while fighting, and this very energy is felt in the game itself. It might sound pretty surface level, but hearing Batman go like, good game Shaggy, after a match is just so silly that I can't bring myself to hate it. These voice lines and interactions were obviously a very big priority for the staff, and this mileage shows. What doesn't help that feeling though, is the art style. I could go on and on about why I don't like the graphics this game has on offer, but nothing I could say could convince you as easily and as quickly as just a peek at Steven Universe's model in that aforementioned teaser. It gives me the same energy as one of those physics-based Unreal Engine indie games. They're a dime a dozen nowadays and all look kinda ugly, and that ugliness is unfortunately shared in multiverses. But to swing things back in a more positive attitude and to complete this compliment sandwich, because because of this generic art style, you have created a style that mostly any character can fit into and not look terrible. The real humans of the cast have been translated in a Disney Infinity-esque fashion, and the cartoon characters look about as good as you can expect them to in 3D. Let's be clear, I don't love the art style, but I love the avenues that this particular art style has opened up for the possibility of any character in this game's roster. And speaking of characters, they are all so loving crafted, and while I originally wanted to go into this script without individually describing them all, I feel like I gotta. Not only have I spent so much time playing this game through two behind closed doors alphas, a closed public alpha, and now an open beta, but as mentioned earlier, each character has a pretty hefty chunk of mechanics at play that all feel wonderful and distinct in motion. So you know what, fuck it, let's talk about every character on multiverses and what they bring to the table in a vaguely favorite to least favorite order. To start, easily my favorite character from what I've played so far, from a probably biased perspective, Steven Universe. Steven, much like his appearance in his show of origin, is a support character through and through. His main gimmick, being his bubble, is a strong move applying a debuff to enemies that traps them in a bubble for a brief period of time. When an enemy is bubbled, you can't do any damage to them, but they also can't move. So in my experience, this move is mostly used as either a way for you and your teammate to focus down on one enemy in doubles, or to give yourself time to break, reposition, or use one of Steven's other setups in the off time. However, Steven is a support character, meaning that this move relies on a teammate to hit effect. Now, as you'll come to see with most characters in multiverses, while the co-op angle is definitely there, it's not necessarily required. But with Steven and his diegetic role of being the ultimate support, it translates his moveset into basically always requiring a teammate to pull off most effectively. And that is where we get into Steven's second big gimmick, his ability to summon a Watermelon Steven, giving him a weak steven light teammate to call upon the aid of whenever you need it. While Watermelon Steven is a useful asset, he is nowhere near the competency of another full-fledged fighter, so he isn't too game-breaking, but he's no slouch either. Multiple times in my experience, either through acting as the last line of defense or straight up getting the final knockout, this watermelon guy has really saved my ass. Steven's other gimmicks consist of a little bit of a heal, an actual proper shield, which he's the only character on the roster to have, and the ability to create a hard wall platform to combo with. But personally, I found these to be less useful than the other stuff in his arsenal. Although his up special creating a platform makes him into Smash 4 Bayonetta levels of godly when it comes to carrying people off the top of the stage. Steven is a character I can absolutely see becoming a monster when it's time for this game to develop its competitive scene. Pun not intended. And speaking of monsters, Jake the dog may not have been my favorite character, but he was oh so close. Jake is brutal in motion. He may be the pub stomper of multiverses, because more so than any other character, I felt like whenever I played him, the stuff I could pull off was positively disgusting. I have a soft spot for stretchy guys, and Jake, true to his character, doesn't have as many fancy gimmicks as others on the roster, opting for his stretchiness to be his main thing. His moves either have long reach, hit like a truck, or both, with a lot of moves stretching further if you hold them down longer. The only two moves that don't follow this pattern are his neutral special, which allows Jake to keep enemies in his mouth, and his up special, which makes Jake into a wall that blocks off areas. 
Jake is one of the least technically complex characters in the game, but boy oh boy does he feel good to play. And from one monster to another, Bugs Bunny surprised me with how enjoyable he was to play. With Bugs, you can dig a hole to teleport teammates, but more or less, projectiles are the name of the game. He can draw or drop a large safe, ride an Acme rocket that acts as a temporary platform, throw pies, summon random items, and does it all with some of the cleanest animations in the game. Weirdly enough, I think Bugs Bunny plays the most like my main in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, King K. Rool. With slow moving projectiles and hitting like a truck being most of Bugs' game plan, I found myself decimating lobbies with him like no man's business. Straight into another borderline cruel pub stomper, the Iron Giant is big. Straight up, the Iron Giant breaks so many pre-established platform fighter rules, and that makes his presence on the roster so much sweeter. Iron Giant is kinda what you would expect from a character who looks like this. Big, slow, powerful combo food. Easily the most you see what you get character on the roster. His main gimmick is that of his bolts, which are friends that buff up the Iron Giant, giving him a passive hitbox and some projectile protection. He can replenish these by eating items or artwork generated by the giant himself, giving him a fun resource collection mechanic on top of his size. He can also go into rage mode after he or his teammates get beat up enough and has a completely different, almost worse feeling move set while in this mode. And oh lord is the Iron Giant just so much fun to play. He's so easy to destroy people with and even easier to get destroyed while playing him, but figuring out how he works and countering others is just a blast. Easily another one of my favorites. And keeping in tow with all of my favorites, LeBron is just too funny to not love. There's definitely something to be said about the idea of a real person being commodified as an IP alongside people like Batman or Steven Universe, but dude, it's just so funny. And I'll also say, weirdly enough, they're just as faithful to LeBron and his aggressive style of basketball as they are to the aforementioned characters, which is strange to be completely honest, but fucking awesome. In game, LeBron revolves mostly around his ball. He has a great, powerful, heavily disjointed moveset with the ball, and a weak, baby, terrible moveset without the ball. And a lot of his moves with the ball involve him throwing the ball to hit an enemy, or passing the ball to a teammate so they can throw it to hit an enemy, reverting LeBron into his ballless state. But you might be thinking, if the moveset without the ball is so bad, then why would you even risk throwing it and losing it? And well, that's because the throw moves have quick windup and very good damage, making them invaluable for combo or getting a quick hit off in neutral. You can get your ball back either with a neutral special on a large cooldown, or if you hit someone with his wet noodle basketball swipes, but that can be a Herculean task. If you throw LeBron's ball, you're gonna want a plan to get it back, meaning that especially in team battles, playing as LeBron actually kind of feels like basketball in the sense that it's a lot of passing and trying to keep your hands on the ball at all times. If you have the ball, you're golden. If you don't, LeBron LeBron's floundering will get your ass kicked. I like LeBron for the same reason I imagine people like playing as Piranha Plant in Super Smash Bros. It's absurd, possibly stupid, and dare I say, a meme, but somehow through all of that weirdness, he is just as lovingly crafted as everyone else on the roster. And the last of who I would dub the multiverse's pub stompers, Superman is one of the better designed characters in the game. I have seen people on the official Discord and the subreddit call him overpowered, but I think this all just comes as a consequence of how awesome they made it to play as Supes. I, like a lot of people, have often found myself thinking that Superman is just a bit too powerful to be lovingly translated into a video game, especially something like this. But as with everything else in multiverses, they found a way to surprise me. Superman's moveset has all of the classic powers there, of course, but the main thing that sets Supes apart in gameplay is his reliance on grappling. Allowing for Superman to throw enemies, move them somewhere else, or get a quick follow-up hit on them. Combine this with a move that allows him to fly, and attacks that are either super slow and powerful, or super quick, animated with super speed effects for good combos, and you get a character with the look, feel, and all the perceived power of Superman without actually making him broken. And I think that is so neat! Keeping in line with DC powerhouses, Wonder Woman is one of the more basic characters on the roster, with her and Shaggy basically 
acting as the roster's tutorials, but she's very fun to play as nonetheless. She has the lasso of truth to pull others, a down special that allows her to shield both her and her teammates, and a sort of rage building mechanic for her gauntlet smash thing that she does in the movies. She's a very mid-range character, not too fast, not too powerful, not that high of a skill ceiling, but that also makes her a character very hard to hate, because while she's not especially great at any one thing, she feels good at everything. In a similar vein of Jacks of All Trades, Finn from Adventure Time is also a very well-rounded character. To be honest, I really wanted to love Finn more than I did, but I felt like I couldn't get a super good grip of his moveset from what I've played. He's decently fast, falling pretty comfortably into the general niche of a sortie, but his main gimmicks set him apart quite nicely from that largely overdone platform fighter archetype. Alongside being able to teleport using a gem, Mr. Mertens collects coins when he beats down on enemies in a moveset akin to Shovel Knight in Rivals of Aether. You can use these coins at Choose Goose's shop to either purchase buffs for you and a teammate or to buy BMO who allows you to blow away enemies with a seriously powerful BMO chop. To me, one of the most enticing parts of Adventure Time was watching Finn constantly equip new gear. It was always a big deal when he got new swords, so seeing this aspect of the series reflected so nicely in Finn's moveset is just nice. And while I never felt like I got truly good at him, Finn's ob special was easily one of the most satisfying knockouts you could land. And continuing on in the more characters I felt like I never got a proper mastery of, Harley Quinn. Harley is probably one of the most technically complex characters in the game. With a bajillion projectiles, this makes her very hard to get a proper hangout. But oh man, when you learn the ropes, she can be so much fun. Harley's attacks give her all of the Harley staples. Guns, a bat, a hammer, and a lot of quirkiness to her movements. If Batman and Superman are both based off of their animated series counterparts, Harley definitely feels like she is based off of her recent characterizations in both the movies and her solo show. Which makes it all the more fun to play as her with her erratic personality. Next up, another character with an erratic personality, Harley's teammate in the trailer, Taz. The Tasmanian Devil's whole gameplay gimmick revolves around his debuff, dubbed Tasty. While most characters in the game have multiple debuffs and buffs they can apply, Taz feels particularly catered around his gimmick. To put it simply, a lot of Taz's attacks deal tasty damage, and when this tasty debuff stacks enough, enemies get cooked. Cooking an enemy turns them into a comically large rotisserie chicken. Cooked enemies can't attack, and when they are hit, they drop chicken bits that will heal Taz and his allies. Aside from the whole tasty thing, Taz can also heal teammates by way of licking them and, well, do the classic Taz things. His spinning tornado move is probably one of the most satisfying moves to land in the entire game. Taz may be labeled as a bruiser, but to be honest, he feels more like a support character. Somewhere in between. Straight up a paladin, if you ask me. And right into another bruiser with a lot of support capabilities, Garnet is weird. As I've been going through this roster and writing about them, I've noticed a lot of the more complex characters are ones that I am not the biggest fan of, and Garnet comes off like that as well. Out of everyone in the roster, I think Garnet has the most abilities that either apply a buff, a debuff, or have a large cooldown, and that makes her a very mindful character to play as, but very overwhelming at the same time. She can stop enemy projectiles, shoot her gauntlets, give out an electric debuff, and vary in character for someone from her show can buff herself up with the power of music but it's just so much like if you don't know anything about this game what do you think the music buff actually does it gives you armor break and a speed boost for the record earlier when i said that this game may be confusing for newbies garnet instantly came to mind i may be a steven universe cuck shill but this character was just not for me to one of the most complex characters, to one of the least, Shaggy is boring. They lean entirely into the gimmick of Ultra Instinct Shaggy for his moveset in multiverses. It's an outdated joke, but given that it was likely taking off when this game was getting its project plan off the ground, I can accept it and giggle along with the creators. But that reliance on the super powerful Shaggy gimmick makes him the Captain Falcon of this game, which is to say, super iconic, but super original to the game with no loving references back to the source material. There is one move on Shaggy's moveset that reflects his status as a character from Scooby-Doo. 
a comically large sandwich that can heal teammates and damage enemies. Well, the Ultra Instinct Shaggy thing takes over the rest of his moveset, giving him the ability to charge a rage buff, changing each of his specials to be different, more powerful versions of themselves. He is cool and very basic. Definitely the tutorial character of this game, and he's not reflective of the true Shaggy character, whatever that means. But I guess if I wanted a character based around the prospects of Scooby-Doo, I would play as Velma. Velma is awesome. While Shaggy is mostly original for his moves, Velma leans into the whole non-fighter in a fighting game gimmick and has a truly special and fun moveset that is very complex, but oh so delightful in execution. To start, Velma's passive gimmick is that of evidence. If her and her ally collect enough evidence, she summons a police card to pick up the nearest enemy, revealing that the enemy was not in fact the enemy, but actually Old Man Jenkins the whole time. And this is so funny. The police car then attempts to drive Old Man Jenkins off the stage, but the car is avoidable and if caught, your teammate can break you out, but in the heat of a match, it's definitely hard to avoid. That's more or less her main thing, but she also has projectiles that can home if they hit with the first attack, a motivational speech that debuffs enemies and heals allies, and the ability to perform the oh-so-cartoonish Velma run, which has swiftly become one of my favorite moves in the game. However, I just need to keep singing the praises of this character because she encapsulates that Scooby-Doo energy so perfectly and has some of the most polished animations in the game. Her three hit combo being her quipping on the enemy is just so brilliant. And speaking of aesthetic brilliance, Batman! Batman is technically interesting, but fell down into one of the more boring to play characters for myself. His moveset in game reflects how Batman plays early on in the Arkham games. With a lot of quick punches, smoke bombs, grappling to teammates and enemies, and batterings, it really makes you feel like Batman. But I never felt like I truly could pull off anything all that great with him. Where Batman really wins my heart is in areas that don't affect gameplay whatsoever. For instance, Batman can glide, and when he glides, he has the classic silhouetted Batman the Animated Series look. And man, I just love the small aesthetics like that. His cape constantly bounding in the wind, Kevin Conroy always having a comment for every situation he's in. It makes me like playing as Batman even though I am absolute trash at the character. And just to drive that point home, from now on we are in the RV is trash at this character tier. And nowhere is that more clear than with the character that I'm probably least familiar with the source material of, Arya Stark. Earlier I said that Finn was a sortie, but Arya is the true sortie in multiverses, fast movement and sword pokes, you know the deal. Arya has two gimmicks that set her apart, one being her face stealing, which allows her to use another character's moves, and the other being her critical hit, allowing her to do more damage if she hits them in the back. Which I know next to nothing about Game of Thrones, but I have seen this scene a million times. So as far as I'm concerned, this is a perfect passive ability for her. Arya is not necessarily complex, but as with a lot of characters of her niche, she is very easy to just flounder around with if you're not sure what you're doing. And I was not sure what I was doing. And the character that I was easily the worst at is probably the best designed one out of the entire Multiverses roster. Tom and Jerry. These guys' entire moveset is animated to look like they are constantly attacking each other at any given opportunity. The charm in the animation alone from this is probably enough to make them a lot of people's favorites, just not mine. Tom and Jerry aren't bad by any means, but to put it in Smash terms, they are the Rosalina and Luma of this game. Meaning that they're the thinking man's characters, someone who loves the setups and the long plays, and I am just not that guy. There is a lot going on with Tom and Jerry, and I likely can't do their moveset any justice without explaining every little intricacy, but I'm just gonna put it in very simple terms. Tom can shoot Jerry away at any time. Jerry can stick to allies or just stick wherever. All of Tom's attacks have different properties to them when Jerry is away from Tom. This leads to you basically trying to trap enemies between Tom and Jerry to create combos. This moveset is perfect for their character dynamic, but not great in my hands. But hey, every character isn't designed for every person, it's fine. If you couldn't tell, this game does a tremendous job of making everyone play like how they appear in their source media. 
This game's biggest strong suit for me right now is how good of a job they do at representing the individual characters through their movesets. And as a consequence of that, the only character that I didn't really like is Rain Dog, and I think it's fairly simple to see why. Being an original character in a game otherwise dripping with fan service and near perfect platform fighter translations for all of its characters really hurt this guy's shot at being decently likable. His moves feel unoriginal and derivative of other platform fighters, his character theming and design is meh, and standing alongside giants shows how unremarkable this character truly is. It's a shame, but I hope that Rain Dog stays this game's only original character. This game's roster has a little something for everyone. From the young gays, to the old farts, to the one remaining Game of Thrones fan, and that is super important because nowadays a good set of characters is the reason most people will give a game like this a shot in the first place. Rosters, especially in the platform fighter space, can really make or break a game. This genre is one that has become very reliant on a roster full of diverse and interesting and likely pre-established in other media characters. And a roster this deep in execution really did wonders for keeping me invested in multiverses. But with that being said, I think it's about high time we talked about a certain monopolistic elephant in the room. And that is Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. I know it's a big dead meme for someone to refer to a game as the Smash Killer, but comparisons to Smash in the platform fighter space are inevitable. I said earlier that comparing this game to Smash Bros. is reductive, and I totally stand by that statement, but at the same time, most people only know about platform fighters through Smash Bros. And that is why every major news publication has been calling multiverses a Smash clone. So please, let me end this video with an important comparison. Smash Bros. has had a monopoly on this genre forever now. Other games have tried to slide in, create a niche for themselves, create a community, and have all more or less gone the way of the dinosaur. Smash Bros. is the classic, the original. No one's gonna take that away from it. But multiverses? It feels like a fresh take. This is the first time I have felt like a platform fighter released by someone other than Nintendo wasn't just trying to be Super Smash Bros. Melee 2. If there's one thing I can commend multiverses for, it's that it's different. Warner Bros. crossovers, crossover fighters, hell, even crossover platform fighters are all things that are so very diluted in the market right now. I have now seen Shaggy, Batman, and Finn in the same game twice. It's not that special anymore. But the different buffs and debuffs, being able to customize each character, the rollback netcode, the fact that every character in the game has voice acting acknowledging the world around them, it makes this game feel like the first platform fighter innovation in a very long time. And that is why you should be excited for, and hopefully already playing, multiverses. I'll see you online. And if you're excited for my channel's future, then why don't you subscribe to RV Rocks and ring the bell, like this video, and comment your thoughts on multiverses. This was a long in, and I need video engagement, so I challenge you to drop the hottest takes imaginable in the comments, and who knows if it's hot enough, I'll probably respond to it. Please let me know your thoughts either in the comments below or on Twitter at RV of Rocks. But before you do any of that, I have been RV Rocks, and as always, thank you so much for watching. See ya!